Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Springfield at the Illinois State Museum. If you haven't heard, it's Illinois bicentennial year and here at the Illinois State Museum, it's the bicentennial and beyond, their new exhibit. You know, they have 13 million items at the Illinois State Museum, so it's really always a problem to decide what they want to show. And Erica Holst is the curator, or one of the curators of this exhibit. It is kind of tough when you have all that, but it gives you an opportunity to go through everything and say, what do we want to showcase for a special exhibit? It was a lot of fun. I bet it was. Yeah. I bet it was fun. 13 million items. You and how many other people worked on this, or how many other curators worked on this? Well, uh, I would say, you know, there's um, about 30 people on staff, and it was a team effort, so mm -hmm. everyone contributed to it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. When, when, you, when you came up with the idea, okay, let's do something for the bicentennial, and then it was like, okay, let's we got a legacy collection. We have a collection of things that people never get a chance to see. Absolutely. So let's pull some themes together here for the Bicentennial and make a, and make a special exhibit. And we're going to go through that today. And you have a wonderful uh, exhibit hall here to do that with. But right now, we're in the entrance hall to the main exhibit hall. And you've used this space for, for that purpose, haven't you? Absolutely, yeah. So the whole point of the exhibit is kind of to take the best of the best, mm -hmm. um, the things with the best stories, the most interesting, the most representative representative of Illinois and pull them together and put them out for people to see. So, you know, it's it's a really cool visual display and we also hope people read the labels too because they've got really great stories. <laughs> well, let's start walking down the, right here. I mean, because you, every one of these boxes, every one of these panels has a, has a theme and the theme of this is if you look at the photograph in the background, this is the Illinois State Museum, what, a hundred years ago or so, huh? Right. So we call this our Cabinet of Curiosities because this literally is a photo of the State Museum in the 19th century and that's what going to the museum was you know you would see all these specimens of interesting things from around the state mm -hmm. um, you know that people just couldn't flip on the TV and see so it was thrilling to see them and and still today it kind of packs a punch to look and say oh there's a lemur next to you know I, a I know. pistol and a you know and you know arrowhead. what's fascinating too is how much museums have changed you know it, it used to be that a museum was just a collection but now, you know, you, we, we've grown to where, where themes are very important and grabbing people's attention and, and leading them in certain places is kind of where you like to go. And it's, and it's fascinating. I mean, every, here, for instance, look at the, this panel right here shows one of the worst tornadoes in national history and, and it went through Illinois in 19, what, 25, 25, I think? yeah. So that tornado picked up that board and drove it straight through that tree. You, well, you can see some of the pictures of the damage and this, this board right into the tree. And if you look right above the tree trunk, you see the photograph of the man who's doing a pull up on that, yeah. on that board driven into the maple tree. So wow. that was in 1925, uh, 695 people died in oh. three and a half hours that that tornado That was through. a tragic, tragic tornado, it really was. And then uh, of course, we have, uh, these are the, this is Grant and Lincoln and Washington, and this is really kind of cool woodwork, isn't it? Yes, and this is a uh, folk artist from Sangamon County named Frank Richards, and he was a farmer, so you know mm -hmm. he kind of carved these things in his spare time, and every 4th of July, he put this little display out. There's him on his front lawn, <laughs> and you know we have all the artifacts. We were able to almost kind of recreate the photo here. That's right, that's right, that's really cute. It's cute, I mean, and he would do this every 4th of July, and of course back then, you know, People would, would, wouldn't drive by, they'd walk by, and hey, they all look at Mr. Richardson's. Got all kinds of, I'm not gonna ask you about this because you're not a naturalist, I know, right? I'm okay. the Curator of Decorative <laughs> Arts and History, so the natural history is not my expertise, but it's neat, you know, it makes me wanna read the labels and learn more about it. Uh, Looks like it's a stag moose and a giant beaver, holy moly. I know, I know, Illinois has changed. This is a, this has had interesting stories here, I mean, they, People mourned differently when they oh, lost absolutely. their Oh, absolutely, and back people kind of, you know, um, were more up close and personal with death than we are today. You know, now we're a little bit afraid of it. Then people sort of, you know, embrace the mourning process. And well, and they had the, you know, they had the the wakes in their homes. Oh know? yeah. So I mean, it was yeah. much more. It was much more personal. It was. And, it uh, was. And now you can see, for instance, in this case, th this man I think was a farmer. He was and, a farmer. And so he has a, a wheat a wheat wreath. 
He's a wheat oh, chef, yeah, and he yeah. died in November of 1904. So there's no florist with a refrigerated case full of flowers. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they assembled wheat and put it on his grave. Yeah. And the little girl up above, her name was Charlotta Richardson, and she died in England in the 1850s when she was four years old. When her family immigrated to Illinois, they brought that image with her. It's probably, you know, one of the only images they had with her. Mm -hmm. So they brought it to remember her by. Mm -hmm. And then the cemetery urn was made by um, the Kirk Kirkpatrick's uh, Anna Pottery Company. And so they did this wonderful, you know, elaborate ceramic funerary, you know, monument, which mm -hmm. you kind of rarely see. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the next panel here, this is interesting because a, a lot of us that live in this area are aware of the coal wars uh, and the labor, the labor disputes that, that occurred earlier in the century, or last century. But somehow the Illinois State Museum became the owner of all of these weapons that were used in the coal wars. Yes, and I don't know how. I know mm -hmm. they were um, transferred over from the Illinois Arsenal at one point, but um, they were apparently confiscated after the conflict, and, and now we have them. So each of those little red tags um, is the name of a miner who you know, carried the mm -hmm. weapon in the 1930s. And boy, they were all weaponized at that point. I mean, that was a dangerous, that was a dangerous profession, number one, anyway. Uh, but then when the wars were and going on. And when the on, wars were oh, going on, people man. were getting killed in the street. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and technology, boy, has it changed. Technology, and this is kind of neat. Because yeah. this goes, we're going back to like the period of the late 1800s here, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Well, that uh, sewing machine dates from about uh, 1860. And, you know, that went from you'd have a woman who would take about 10 hours to make a shirt to if she did it on her sewing machine, it would take her one hour. So you mm -hmm. can imagine that was just life changing typewriters and light bulbs and a TV set. My goodness, we're and stepping up. Those two light bulbs um, kind of are at the heart of the way we use electricity today. Mm -hmm. So um, the one on top with the little round bulb kind mm -hmm. of uh, globe, that was developed by Thomas Edison and that ran on direct current. And then Nicholas Tesla thought that there must be a better way than direct current. He yeah. developed alternating current. And he sold his patent to George Westinghouse. And it all came down to the Chicago Columbian Exposition of 1893, which was going to use a ginormous amount of light bulbs sure. and electricity. And both Edison and Westinghouse bid on the contract, and Westinghouse won. And so today we use alternating current. It kind of set the standard for the way the rest of the country would use okay. electricity. Okay, so the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893 probably determined all of that? Yes, yeah, it, it all came down to that. Okay, we have more of that in the main part of the exhibit uh, from the 1893, so let's walk in there. Erica, the World's Fair of 1893 in Chicago. We were just talking about how it was electrified. Oh, yeah. Um, this is one of the first things you see as you enter the main hall, and it's a remarkable quilt. Would you think it was even more remarkable if I told you a man made it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I didn't know men made quilts, but it is, I mean, I don't know why not. I mean, men can sew. Men, men can, can yeah. sew, yeah. Oh, it's remarkable. So this is um, considered a crazy quilt, mm -hmm. and this was done to commemorate the World's Fair in 1893. So front and center, we've got Christopher Columbus. Right, up in, the, the, right up in the middle, there's Christopher Columbus. It huh? was the okay. Columbian Exposition mm -hmm. that celebrated the 400 year anniversary of Columbus's discovery of North America. Sure, yeah, yeah. And so there's all these little, you know, details that only someone who was around in Chicago in 1893 okay, would looking, recognize. I think we're looking at Washington right here, We've right? got George okay. Washington. And to his left, there's a woman. This is Mrs. Potter Palmer. She was Back one of here. the fair's organizers in 1893. Is that right? So they would have known who she is then. Oh, Nobody yeah. knows she her was, historically. She was a big society lady. What about lady. down to the right here? It's President uh, Grover Cleveland. He opened the fair in 1893. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then And then we have the Duke of Veragua of Spain. He was Christopher Columbus's only living descendant in 1893. Ah, okay. So in, was he present for the fair or do we even know? I think he was present. Oh, I think they neat. invited him. And then um, up in the corner We've got a little, um, that's yeah. Carter Henry Harrison. He was the mayor of Chicago. He uh -huh. was actually uh, assassinated by a disappointed office seeker the day before the fair closed. And so oh. he, he commemorated there too. Wow. Well, that's remarkable. 
And okay. we put that there to tie in with our World's Fair case here, where we've got a lot of souvenirs from the Columbian Exposition. You sure do. So we've got a entrance ticket. We've got a um, right here's the entrance ticket right in the front. Yeah, expressly for October 9th, 1893. And this was Chicago Day. They were Chicago celebrating day. Chicago on that day. And then to the right, somebody made a, a cotton handkerchief for the World's Fair. As a souvenir. Mm -hmm. Then we've got this little flask. This was also made by the Anna Pottery folks, the same people who made the cemetery urn. And they were, they were kind of cheeky. They had a little bit of a sense of humor, because I'm not sure if you uh, see where the hole of the flask is. Are, where are you're you talking to, about? What? The pig-shaped oh, flask pig okay. at the uh -huh. top, yeah. So this was kind of a, <laughs> you know, cheeky little souvenir. Yeah. Now, the, the building parts, the, uh, it looks like a leg of a, th those were, those, the buildings were made of that material? And they, they were, were just made of plaster and it was, it was entirely temporary, you know, it got uh, really? basically plowed into Lake Michigan when they were done. And right? so, you know, this was yeah. part, of, part of what was dredged up at a later mm -hmm. date. Wow. Well, let's move around this way because I want to show something called tramp art. And I think you'll be able to explain to us what that is. These young ladies are looking at it too. Pretty cool, huh? It's, well, it is, I don't know, I've never seen anything like it, I know that. And this is called Tramp Art, and it's a radio cabinet? It's a radio cabinet. So this is all made out of wooden cigar boxes. Um, you would, you know, break it apart and notch it. So this was made by a gentleman who was essentially a drifter. And he stopped by a Will County farm in 1911, and he said that if you will put me up for the winter, give me a place to stay and feed me, I'll build you this radio cabinet. Mm -hmm. And so this man spent the entire winter there. They went from tavern to tavern collecting these wooden cigar boxes, and he built this <laughs> entire thing. And that's where they would have put the radio, right in front. Can, can you show us how this, and it has drawers too, yeah, doesn't it? it has drawers. Okay, and that shows you sort of how the wooden boxes uh, and then all of this would have been hand carved, wouldn't hand it? Hand notched, yeah. yeah. So incredible attention to detail. Wow, no kidding. There's a little uh, scene of the crucifix. Sure, in the front. he made a little scene in the in the top. And the side. And he wanted to stay a little longer, so he put a little top on. Yeah, he had a lot of probably work to made do. it as elaborate as possible. Yeah. He made this little cabinet on top. Mm -hmm. But. The, the big, the master part was the radio, man. You could put a radio. Right, yeah. Open the door and put the radio And radio, radio was everything at the time. That was, that was before television. Radio was everything. That's really interesting. I guess there were tramps that would, that would make other things. They, they would just, if, hey, I'll, I'll stay and work. Oh, you yeah, know? sure. Um, Do so, odd jobs. Sure, and, whatever. And, yeah. and we were talking about men and making quilts. Yes, there's <laughs> well, another one. <laughs> this is, and the story behind this is fascinating because this guy, he, he must have, his name was Albert Small. Yes. And he must have had a, a, a real thirst for tedious work because yeah, he did tedious work all day and then he came home and did this at night. Real attention to detail, yeah. yes. So he um, decided that he wanted to make the quilt that had the most number of pieces in it. Mm -hmm. And so um, he, he had two practice quilts, but this was his masterpiece. There are 123,000 pieces of fabric in this quilt. Each of them are a quarter of an inch wide. Po point out a piece of fabric to us so that, so that oh, the viewer can see. see. This, this green piece, which is smaller than the tip of my little finger here. That's one piece, and there are a hundred and some thousand of them, and you can see that he just he just keeps going and going and going. And okay. this, I mean, this was a this was a manly man. He worked at the <laughs> Ottawa Silica plant. He worked with heavy explosives all day, and then he would come home and pick up his needle and thread. And his wife and daughter-in-law they did help him stitch it together, but he uh -huh. did all the cutting and piecing of it. He uh, it took him it took him four years. Four yeah. years to do Four this. years, and it was um, work, featured I mean. in Ripley's Believe It or Not. We, we think that this is the quilt with the most pieces ever anywhere. Erica, is it your opinion that uh, large-scale government corruption may have begun with Governor Matson back in the 1850s? I think it did in the 1850s, yeah. so that tells you something. And we actually have 
his chair here, and the chair and the piece of canal script behind it kind of tell the story of, you know, maybe the first large-scale corruption in Illinois. Um, Governor Matson was a very wealthy man. He's the one who uh, arranged for the construction of our current executive mansion because mm -hmm. basically the one before wasn't up to his standards. So he did give us this, you know, beautiful executive mansion that has currently been restored. Mm -hmm. um, he was limited to only one term in office, so he built himself a gorgeous mansion across the street, which cost $100,000 in oh, 1856. Oh, that was a ton of money back yes, then. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it was, you know, by far and away the nicest one in town, and he filled it with all this spectacular furniture, including this chair. You know, this is a rosewood, highly upholstered chair. It would have been the height of fashion at the mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. Well, lo and behold, after his term in office is done, we find out that part of his wealth um, came from the fact that he was embezzling money from the state of Illinois. So back in the 1830s, to fund the Illinois and Michigan Canal, mm -hmm. the state of Illinois had issued canal scrip, and we have a piece of it framed right here. This is basically like a bond. You know, you buy yeah. it, you can redeem it at a bank. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be voided. Well, Governor Matson found an entire trunk of scrip that had been redeemed but not voided, so he went and redeemed it again. He redeemed uh, $200,000 from the state of Illinois. Whoa. And um, part of it went into his beautiful house, so mm -hmm. they called that house Scrip Villa. Scrip <laughs> and the, uh, the postscript to that story is, um, after Matson, his finances took a hit, after his you know, embezzlement was discovered, yeah. and during the Civil War, um, the house passed to his daughter and son-in-law. And in 1873, the family was away from home, and someone noticed that it was on fire. And so this you know, grand mansion was just going up in flames, and people were running in off the street to pull out furniture and paintings. Mm -hmm. So someone actually ran into a burning building to rescue that chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Governor Matson was so you know distraught; he was in frail health to begin with, and yeah. then after that fire, he died three days later. Yeah, yeah. that was too much for him. Okay. It was too much, and we have this sitting next to another chair. Um, this is an earlier chair, so you can see kind of the the difference in luxury between mm -hmm. the 1820s and the 1850s. That rocking chair belonged to a man named Conrad Will, and he was one of the authors and signers of the 1818 Illinois Constitution. Really? And when he died in the 1830s, they uh, formed a new county up in northern Illinois and named it Will County in his honor. After him, okay. And that came out of his home? That came out of his home. Wow, okay. Now, you know, we see a lot of women's clothes. Women's clothes are, are um, they, they're pretty. Designers have always, yeah. have always paid attention to women's, uh, and, and they save them, like you said. But we don't see men's, especially fancy men's shirts very often. We don't. You know, men's, men's shirts live a rough life. They get used <laughs> and abused. And then usually at the end of the life in the 19th century, they would be cut up for bandages or, you know, mm -hmm, used for something mm -hmm. else. So the fact that we have this shirt that survives was wonderful. And then the exciting thing about this is we know who made it. We know who wore it, and we even know the exact date it was worn. Is that right? And how do you know all that? So it came pinned to its collar, a little note that said, worn on father's wedding day and made for him by Grandma Enos. And so, well, whose father? Well, it turns out that his name is embroidered on the side there. Z.A. Enos was Zimri uh -huh. Allen Enos, and he was one of the um, first people born in Sangamon County. His parents huh. were Pascal and Salome Enos. Yeah. They were one of the founding families. So his mother, Salome, hand stitched the shirt, and if you, you know, if you were able to look close, you would see the stitches are almost invisible. You know, the, mm -hmm. the worksmanship is incredible. And because it was his wedding shirt, we know that he wore it on June 10th, 1846, when he got married right here in Sangamon County. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's just a really neat story. And then to top it all off, it turns out that the Illinois State Museum has had in its collections a portrait of Zimri's sister. So this is, um, it's called Portrait of an Enos Girl. We've kind of figured out just by when it was painted and um, how old she looks that it's probably his sister Martha. So we've had this portrait of Martha since the 1970s and now her brother's shirt came to us and oh, now we've got them great. together. That's great, what a good story. And you can actually document the date and the time and everything, that's really wonderful. Now, we were looking at quilts earlier, and you know, quilts weren't the only thing that large scale things that people were making for around the house. This looks like, it, you call it a piano cover, it's square, so it must have gone like on a square grand piano of some kind. 
Uh, but little girls put this together, is that right? They were teenagers. Teenagers. But yeah, and so they had this idea. They decided to write letters to every single governor's wife in the United States, and they asked for a piece of their gown, a fabric swatch, and every single governor's wife personally hand wrote them a letter and <laughs> sent them a scrap of fabric. Isn't that great? So they've incorporated them into this beautiful textile, and they stitched the names of everyone who contributed, and yeah. even the president's wife, um, Mrs. Benjamin Harrison, from Washington, D.C. And that's at the bottom right too. corner, isn't it? That's, this is Mrs. Harrison, the First Lady. She cooperated as well. They all sent a swatch, and you can see Oregon, Ohio, Illinois, Arkansas, everybody sent, sent one in to the little kids. So and that's you can great. tell that they were teenagers. You know, they misspelled Cheyenne here, and, you know, there's a <laughs> couple right. typos on it. <laughs> They got Boise, right? And they got Boise, right? They got, I don't know if they were being cute, but they called Austin Austi, and, and Arizona and New Mexico hadn't become states yet, so there's no date on them. That's yeah. to be determined. Look at, look, at, look at Santa Fe with the back yeah. of that. That's cute. Well, that's precious. It really is. That yeah. is. Can you imagine writing to every single governor's wife and having them all personally respond? And oh, what a thrill that would be, too, when that arrived in the mail. And we have those letters, too, in our collection, so they're kind of a hoot to read. Well, Erica, Mr. Batchelder from Peru, Illinois, had a miserable experience during World War II. But it didn't all turn out all negative. I mean, he was able to survive. But this is really wonderful because the documentation you have from his experience, from his trials and tribulations, this really tells a story, doesn't it? Right, so his name was Walter. He enlisted in the Marines in 1939. This is how he looked when he went off to war, you know, just a young, happy kid from mm -hmm. central Illinois. And in 1942, his parents got the telegram that every parent dreads. It's that your son is missing in action, you know. And they actually had to live with that uncertainty for another year before they found out that he'd been captured at, um, in Manila Bay and was yeah. now a Japanese prisoner of war. And he remained in Japanese custody for three years. Oof. And so his parents sent letters to him. He only got two of them over a span of three years. He would be able to send communications out. This is a card that the Japanese Army provided. Um, you know, it's not even his handwriting. He was just able to underline, you know, I'm in good health, I'm uh -huh. uninjured. He was able to send a couple messages through the Red Cross. But, you know, just three years of this uncertainty, not knowing how he was doing, if he would come home. And then finally, in 1945, they get the telegram that says, pleased to inform you of liberation from Japanese wow. custody of your son. You don't so. expect to get that. You expect to get a Western Union saying, he's passed away, you know. Yeah, but yeah. Here, here, so he's been you liberated. imagine after three years, oh. the parents getting that and yeah. knowing that he's coming home. Oh. And, you know, they, they found out that, you know, he had, he had just been mistreated. He had been beaten and starved and forced to work in a yeah. copper mine in sweltering conditions. And so, you know, he, he carried those scars. He physically survived. But, you know, they're, they're yeah. emotional scars that you, you can't, um, you know, that you'd always carry with you. So, you know, he, he survived the war, but this man really made the ultimate sacrifice for yeah. his country during wartime. And then we flash forward to 1982. Um, his daughter was getting married, and Walter was in the hospital by that point and couldn't be at the wedding. And so to, um, to keep him present, you know, to incorporate him in the tradition, his daughter made her wedding dress out of his World War II silk parachute. Oh, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. So he was there in spirit for sure. He was there in spirit yeah, and yeah. You know, his sacrifice and service were, were on display. Well, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Let's walk over here. There's a picture of a little girl here. I know some of these are, are sad. I know, you know they're there's, sad. There's, there's this is sad, but it's, it, it is poignant. And, and this little girl, when you look at the picture of her, um, you're not really ready for a, a sad story like this. But this documentation shows what the family went through it. It makes it very real. We're, what are we looking at here? What, what, this is this is what a track that her mom kept of, of her. She was diabetic, 
and she was trying to find the right balance of foods to feed her, I guess, wasn't right. she? Right, so she was born in 1917, and this is, you know, before anyone knew about insulin. So, you know, you could see this beautiful little girl and her pet bunny there, and um, she couldn't metabolize sugar, so she, you know, literally couldn't derive nutrition from mm -hmm. the food that she was eating, and so her mother made these, you know, menus, three meals a day, every day, just trying to prepare food that, you know, her daughter could eat, mm -hmm. and, you know, she was hospitalized a lot, she was getting weaker they would take her to the hospital in Danville and finally a doctor wrote them a letter and said you know there's nothing we can do mm -hmm. and so this poor little girl died when she was five years old in 1922 and you know the heartbreaking irony is that just months after she died um, Eli Lilly started developing insulin on a large scale mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. so it just kind of you know makes you appreciate modern medicine well, sure and does. medical advances Erica, another sad story, but Mary Todd Lincoln never got over Abraham's death. In fact, did she wear this mourning dress all the time? Well, she wore black all the time, and this was a woman who had loved beautiful clothes, loved to dress up, mm -hmm. and Lincoln's death really took the heart out of her. Mm -hmm. And then after that, she had her youngest son die as well. And so we believe this um, bodice to this dress dates to around, you know, 1875 mm -hmm. to 1880. And this is, you know, this is what she wore, and this mm -hmm. was her, her life. She was a mm -hmm. grieving widow and a bereaved mother. Yeah, for, for the rest of her life. For the rest of her life. The, one of the last things you see when you turn the corner here, the, the last corner of the exhibit, this enormous, enormous American flag from 18, do you know the date by any 61. chance? 61. 1861, and you remember the date how? Because that's the year Lincoln was inaugurated, mm -hmm. and that's the year the flag was flown. It was created by a group of women in Schuyler County. And so, you know, imagine it's 1860, there's a sectional crisis, that the country's in turmoil, mm -hmm. and you're a woman and you don't have the vote, you know? There's nothing right. you can do about it. And so what these women could do is pick up their needle and thread. And so they sewed this flag, and this was their expression of patriotism and, you know, mm -hmm. support for the candidate who mm -hmm. they thought could best preserve the union. These ladies from Schuyler County, most of them probably from Rushville, got together and this is what they were able to do. You Absolutely. And it flew, they, they, they flew it, uh, for the inauguration, inauguration in 1861 of March Abraham March 4th, Lincoln. 1861 is yeah. when this flag was flying. Wow, that's precious. That is precious. Well, this is just part of the legacy collection that the Illinois State Museum has during its Bicentennial and Beyond exhibit, which is here through February of next year. With another Illinois Story in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.